Just some reminders here in the uh, interview room. If you need satellite coordinates, please see uh, the folks at Hammond Communications. They will be able to help you out. If you're joining by Zoom today, uh, use the raise hand function and we'll work our best to uh, work you in uh, the interview process. All post-game press conferences this weekend will be transcribed by ASAP Sports. And also here in the interview room, please make sure your electronic devices are set to silent. And a reminder that there is no recording of these press conferences here in the interview room on cell phones or cameras. We'll uh, wait for Coach Dutcher and then get going with press conference number one. cell phones please set to silent and if you have a question please raise your hand we've got microphones on both sides of the room we will work to get them to you tell us who you are uh, and where you're from and then ask your question to coach and uh, we'll get started hopefully with an opening statement from coach Dutcher here welcome to the sweet 16. thank you excited to be here representing san diego state and uh, playing a very good alabama team we're excited for the challenge and we're ready to play trip was easy uh, we're excited about the opportunity and uh, looking forward to tip tomorrow night. Thanks, Coach. Start with questions. Let's start on the, our left side here in the middle two rows. And then we'll go back in the back on the right. And how much of that is owed to him recording last year and the work he did during that time? Jaden is a tireless worker, so his redshirt year, he put a lot of time into his game. And to be honest with you, uh, he's capable of doing way more than he's doing for us right now. And so uh, whatever he is now, he's just touching the uh, surface of what he's going to be, in my opinion. If uh, we're fortunate enough to have him back next year, uh, I think you'll see an even better version of him. And he is a tireless worker. He devotes a lot of hours in the gym uh, to work on every aspect of his game. and. Uh, Hopefully we'll get enough of them, out of them this year where uh, we can advance. Stay in the middle here, yep. Yeah. Uh, Bryce Miller, San Diego Union Tribune. What is it like to play as an underdog? It's, it's so rare for you guys. You're generally the favorite in almost every Mountain West game, conference tournament. You gotta go back to find more than a couple of games in a row, but almost to November. Um, what about this position you're in in terms of you know, assuming that role a little bit? You know, we really don't talk about it a whole lot, to be honest with you, Bryce. We're just playing good basketball, and uh, our opponent has always been ourselves. I tell the team that. Uh, our standard is to play up to whatever our capabilities are, regardless of the opponent. So if we play really good San Diego State basketball, we'll have a chance to win the game. Just one follow-up. When you, when you see a number like that, and maybe you don't even know what the point spread is, um, but is that you know, motivating in any way that, that uh, they're a favorite to seven, seven and a half points? Not really. Uh, we don't pay a lot. Of, I don't pay a lot of attention to that. You know, I'm just trying to get the best out of our team 
And if Alabama plays their best and they come out on top, like I said, we'll tip our hat to them. But we want to play the best basketball we're capable of playing, and then we'll see what the results are. Going to go the back on the right-hand side, Coach. Ryan Hennessy, WVTM 13 in Birmingham, Alabama. I just want to ask about what you've seen out of this Alabama team. Like was just asked with the number one next to their name in this whole entire tournament, what have you been telling your team and how do you kind of just focus on one at a time with Nate Oates and the team that he has this year? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've done this long enough to know we watch on tape and we think, well, this will work or that will work and we're going to be able to take advantage of that. And then you step on the floor and you see their length. And we know what that is, you know. We thought we saw a lot of things against uh, Arizona, and you step on the floor, and Balo's the biggest man on the floor by a ton. So I'm interested to see once we get on the floor how much length that is and uh, what effect it has on the game. Front row, right side here. Gary Graves, Associated Press. Uh, I guess regarding the whole, how has kind of, I'll say, adapted? whole thing of, of being under the radar is that that's something that they've kind of fed up you know we're not like coach Fisher said we're not a one-hit wonder we have a program we have a culture so I don't care what game we go into we don't consider ourselves an underdog we just look at the next opponent so we're not embracing the underdog role we're just trying to embrace San Diego State basketball and be the best version of us so it never comes up with a conversation. We never look at ourselves as an underdog. We think we have a really good program. Coach, we have two questions on our left-hand side here. Hey, Coach, Johnny Conn, ABC 3340 Sports in Birmingham. Alabama plays a fast, up-tempo style of basketball. Is that a style your team's willing to play tomorrow, or are you going to try to try to slow them down a little bit? Yeah, obviously, we'd like to run selectively. You know, if we get a break, we're going to run. We're not going to pull the ball out and slow the game down. But at the same time, we have to convert defensively. We have to build walls and, and, and try not to let them get up and down the floor on us. I don't think we'll try to play a Gonzaga game where it's 190 final score. You know, we'll, we play good defense. We'll try to control the tempo. And like I always say, if we can turn it into a half-court game, and this is no matter who we play, Mountain West games, whatever, you know, I like our chances in a half-court game. Hey, Coach. Uh, Jamal Kennedy, WCFA 12 Sports in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, looking at your schedule, the teams that you've played, the Arizonas, the Ohio States, you played Arkansas. Uh, just from watching this Alabama team on tape, where do they rank in terms of overall team, I guess, uh, compared to the, to the other teams that you've, you've played already this year? They're super deep, and, and Coach Oates can decide how deep he wants to go. I heard his press conference the last, uh, after their last win, and he just said, we didn't go as deep because the TV timeouts are longer and I felt our guys were fresh enough. So he has a deep bench at his disposal. The thing I like best about their team is, is we all talk about their offense because they're so dynamic offensively, yet they're ranked higher than we are defensively. So that's the part that doesn't get talked about. What a great defensive team this is, how hard they play, what a great job he does uh, making it hard for the other team to score. But when you're so good offensively, everybody wants to talk about that. But we've also uh, tried to find ways uh, where we think we can score some baskets on them, which will be a task. We have a question, center uh, row back. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Brian, you touched on this a little bit with their defense and their, their length, but uh, can you maybe just describe what you see on film of how that all kind of goes back to Charles Bediaco and, and just what he's able to do protecting the rim? Yeah, Bediaco is uh, the ultimate rim protector where you even watch early season games like Gonzaga and Coach Fuse talking about how we have to not be afraid to take mid-range shots because he's tough to finish over. So like most teams, I'm sure we'll have guys that will go in there and attempt to finish on him. And, and if they don't, then they'll have to make the adjustment. But it's hard to say, uh, you play all year, you can get to the rim and finish, and then you get to this game and all of a sudden you can't finish. So uh, hopefully we go in there, uh, we take the best shot that they'll allow us to get. You know, and maybe it won't be all the way to the rim with him in the game. Maybe it'll be a mid-range floater, something like that. But we have to be willing to take uh, the best open shot we can get. Right side, back. Coach Mitch Brown, Fox 56 in Lexington, Kentucky. The last time a regional was here in the, the South region was here in 2019, the champion came out of this region. Uh, so what would it mean for your program with this group of teams you're going against this weekend uh, to come out as the last one standing? I mean, it's March basketball, and I always say March is for players. 
So as coaches, we just have to put them in a position to win. But it's the players that make these uh, March Madness plays, these one shining moment plays that you either advance with or you don't. So marches for players, I'm going to try to put them in a position to have their March uh, moment. Next question, left side, back row. Brian Dane O'Neill with The Athletic. You talked about getting them into a half court game and trying to force that tempo without giving away the trade secrets. How, how can you make that happen? Well, we have to convert. I mean, we'll decide how many to send to the offensive glass, whether we'll send three to the glass or four to the glass or one to the glass in order to get back and stop transition baskets. So a lot of that's in-game adjustments, whatever we start with. I think that's the beauty of our coaching staff. You know, it's a long 40 minutes and not to overreact, to know that when we get to a timeout, if we feel we need to make an adjustment, we'll make it. And this team, uh, we're not bold enough to say, this is how we play, good luck. Uh, we'll change how we play in order to win a basketball game. So whether that's sending multiple guys back defensively, whether that's uh, uh, switching how we play, what tempo we play with, uh, we're not afraid to change in order to try to win a basketball game. Next question here, left side, uh, center. Thanks, Joe Goodman, AL.com. Brian, there are a bunch of teams in the Sweet 16 that have never made the Final Four. Um, do you think that's a trend, that that's the sign of a trend? Do you, what do you think about the parity, I guess, in this tournament? That's the best thing about this tournament, that anyone has a chance, you know? And, you know, people talk about upsets, but uh, uh, I said in our, of our team, our first game against Charleston, uh, we were fortunate to win. We looked nervous in the opening game. And that's one thing you can't account for as coaches is like that nerve level of your players, which ones that can affect more than others playing on this stage. I thought after the first game, we settled in and we looked more like ourselves. So hopefully that continues. Hopefully, uh, having played two games, we're more comfortable playing the third one. But you never know. There's always that nerve, a one and done situation, what can happen. And that's the beauty of the, the tournament. And, and then as a follow up, what makes this weekend different, I guess, you know, in the in the larger picture of the tournament? It's, you know, it's typically survive in advance. It's, you know, I always said, like, we're paid to do this. You know, we're paid to win basketball games. So this is a basketball game. So our job is to get the team ready to play. And so whether it's an opening game or this game, uh, we kind of prepare the same way. I'm, I'm a big believer in routine. So I'm not going to change our routine. I want everything to feel the same way all year every game and so if we're in our routine and we believe in what we're doing we'll have a chance to come out uh, as a winner next question front row right side uh, gary graves ap what have what has pleased you about your defense the last six games uh, i mean what have you seen differently that you know you feel like has helped you particularly in the ncaa tournament I've said this, when we recruit kids to our program, we tell them the first thing they have to do is play defense. So it's not the last six games, it's a culture. You know, if you come to San Diego State, you have to defend, you have to want to defend, and then we'll let you play free offensively. We'll let you play with great freedom within framework. And so these are kids that have brought here knowing to play in this program, they have to defend at a high level. So it's as much our culture as anything else. So uh, we have an ability, I think, to switch one through five ball screens, and like I said, we're not afraid to jump out and double the ball screen. We're not afraid to be in drop defense. We'll do whatever it takes for a given game. We're not bold enough to say, this is what we do, good luck. We try to watch the opponent, and we try to see what will work best against that opponent. And so I just, I just think it's, we have enough humility to say, we're not going to just bully everybody and win this way. We're, we're coaches, and we change game plans, and we have a group that's old and mature enough to adjust to a game plan if we make a change. I think we had one question here, right side, center, then we'll go to the left side on the end. Coach, you spoke on the depth of Alabama just a minute ago, but uh, can you speak on the depth of your team? Because you can go just as much nine men deep as they can, and so how do you anticipate to um, kind of match what Alabama does in that regard? Yeah, that's been the, the beauty of our season is our depth. And it's easy to say you're gonna play nine or 10 guys, it's having a team that's willing to accept that, you know, and not pout when they come out of the game and not drop their head, why am I coming out? And you have to spend five minutes talking to a guy on the bench and explaining to him why he came out of the game. Our guys have embraced it. They want to win. 
Uh, they know our strength is our depth, and so we have a bunch of guys playing 20-some minutes a game, and uh, they embrace that. Uh, I tell them, if you're fortunate enough to play at the next level in the NBA, guess what? You're going to be asked to come off the bench and make your first shot. If you can't do that, you won't play in the league very long. And so uh, you have to embrace whatever role you play, and we, I've got a group that's been able to do that. Left side, a couple more here. Coach, both you and Nate are Michigan guys. Obviously, he started at the high school ranks at Romulus and then worked his way up to Buffalo, Alabama. Have you, have you followed his rise, and how cool is it to have two guys from the same state coaching on the biggest stage? It's, it's great. You know, Coach Oates has done an incredible job. Like I said, he was fortunate enough to get a high school job. I couldn't get a high school job when I started, sending resumes out. So everybody's got a different path. So uh, I've been blessed to have been raised in the game. My dad obviously was a longtime head coach at the University of Minnesota, Eastern Michigan, assistant at Michigan like I was. And so uh, there's a lot of different paths in this business. And uh, uh, Coach Oates has done a great job on the path he started on. Romulus High School all those years ago, Buffalo and now at Alabama and uh, really good coach. Uh, really good person, and um, I'm a, I haven't got to spend much time with him, but we're going to spend uh, two hours together tomorrow night. Time for one more question. Back row, right side. John Salty, AL.com. Brian, there are some different theories about the shooting struggles in the NCAA tournament. Some people say it's the ball. Some people think the ball is overinflated. Is that something you've heard from your players at all? Is there any theories as to what might be happening out here? It's interesting. I don't have a, a group that complains about anything. I could send them a cold, I could serve them a cold meal, they're not going to complain. They're just really grateful for everything they get, and so they're happy to play. Uh, tight rims, overinflated balls, they never say one word about anything. They just go out and play, and they enjoy playing together. So, no, I haven't, we haven't talked one thing about any of that. All right. Coach, appreciate your time here today. We'll get the uh, Aztecs in here in just a second. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good luck.
to let you know the uh, San Diego State student athletes are on their way to the interview room. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Where's the Dutch? He already, he already did his stuff. He Okay, the SDSU uh, student athletes are here in the interview room. Just a reminder about uh, cell phones on silent and no recording uh, video of the press conferences. And when you're addressing uh, your question, please identify uh, one of the student athletes uh, for that particular question, and we will get started with that. So if you have any questions, let us get a microphone to you. Left side, center. Um, Bryce Miller, San Diego Union Tribune. Matt, it's, it's very rare this season that you guys are an underdog. You're a favorite in almost every Mountain West game. Um, with any regularity, you got to go back to maybe Maui. Uh, how does that uh, impact thinking, if it does at all, in, in, this, uh, in this game? Yeah, uh, just like you brought up Maui, you know, we, we've had games where, you know, we were picked to lose, and I think we came out on top, or we gave them a good battle. So, uh, you know, thinking back to Maui or, you know, St. Mary's, any other game, uh, we're just ready to compete. And we know, you know, it's a sweet 16, so anybody can be anybody. And we're not really worried about seeding at this point. We just got to stick to our game plan and try to try our best to win. Um, what about the make? Is there a potential advantage with the makeup of this team? You guys don't have any underclassmen in the rotation, ton of experience, five-year guys, even a six-year guy. Uh, that level of experience, how might that help you in this situation against the number one overall seed? I feel like that's the DNA for a lot of teams that make a deep run in March. Uh, it's something that we have. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of, we have our great game plans. Uh, we hang our hats on defense. And uh, I mean, I feel like we have the great, the, the DNA and the characteristics of a, of a team who makes a deep run in March. Okay, next questions are on the left side, our left. Jamal Kennedy, WSFA 12 Sports in Montgomery, Alabama. Matt, uh, just curious, uh, the level of excitement or maybe um, uh, not uh, just trying to think, the, the adrenaline getting ready to face this Alabama team and, and players like Brandon Miller, just curious to know your, your thoughts and, and you know how, how forward you, you're looking to, to this game tomorrow. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. You know, this is my last season, so uh, to be in the Sweet Six team feels really special with these guys and, you know, this team. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. It's going to be a big game, put us on the map, uh, earn some respect, you know, across the country. So, uh, you know, Brandon Miller, he's a great player, and they got a bunch of other great players. But, you know, we're going to just stick to our game plan and just go out there and get ready for the battle. Stay on the left side with the next question. Johnny Kahn, the ABC 3340 Sports in Birmingham, Alabama. This is for uh, Darian. Um, getting ready to play a guy like Javon Quinterly, who's now playing at the, the peak of his performance, his ability to blow by guards, uh, is that something that you've studied on tape and the difficulty of trying to stay in front of a guy that's that crafty? Uh, definitely. That's something that we worked on all week. Uh, we've had a good week to prepare for that. Um, I feel like we, we've done watched a lot of film and watching the – like uh, tendencies and stuff like that. So I feel like I'm definitely ready up for the challenge. Right side now, center row. Isaac Bourne, mid-major madness. So Nathan, how do you anticipate to battle against a, a guy like Betty Ako tomorrow against Alabama? And how excited are you for an opportunity like that? I feel like in general, we have a great team. And it's not going to only be me guarding him. It's going to be uh, him playing against all the five guys that we have on the floor. And I feel like he has a great opportunity to like make a name for myself. And also, he, me playing against a team like Alabama is going to uh, bring the best out of me. OK, we're going to go front row, right side, and then we'll go back to the center on the left. Uh, for Lamont, um, 
your coach was, was talking about when guys come into this program that they embrace a culture, um, specifically defense. How much of an adjustment has that been for you? And how, why do you feel like this team has em embraced that, that philosophy so well? I feel like... I feel like the team has embraced the defensive culture just because everybody wants to win. Uh, guys come here to win, and that's uh, the DNA of a, a championship team. Um, defensively, uh, we, we go out there every night, try to shut teams down, and uh, that's, our, that's our best form of winning, and uh, that's why everybody embraces it. Left side, center. Keisha, the Alabama, Alabama has a really big front line, probably as big or bigger. I mean, I know you guys played Arizona, but how do you prepare for that size up front? You guys are so physical around the post. Um, we both, we are also a physical team too. So it's just going to basically be a, a physical game all the way around. Uh, me being basically an undersized big for the team, uh, I just got to try my best and get, give my team the all effort. Uh, a lot of times rebounding is about effort, and I'll, I'll give 110% of that for my team. Next question. Right side, back row. John Talty, AL.com. Matt, this is for you. How much did you know about Alabama before you started the kind of game prep, and what's maybe the biggest thing you've learned kind of going through that process? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we've watched them. Uh, I know me personally, I just know they're an extremely talented team. They have a lot of NBA prospects, and, you know, they're, they're ultra talented. Uh, they're also young, you know, and we got experience on our side, so that's one advantage we have, you know, going into this game. But, uh yeah, we, we just know, you know, ultimately they're a really good team and it's, it's going to be a battle in order to beat them. Let's go back to the left side. This is all, also from Matt. Coach is saying when you guys get teams in the half court, he thinks you can beat anybody in the country. What makes you so effectively defensively as a unit when you break teams down and kind of slow the game down in half court game? Yeah, like at, at, uh, the question you mentioned earlier about, you know, Javon, uh, it's not one against one. It's, it's one against five against us in the half court. Uh, we have each other's back. We make multiple efforts, second, third, fourth efforts, to, you know, stop somebody. And, you know, we know what type of talent they have. And it's not going to just be one-on-one, -on -one, you know, isolation game all day. It's going to be, you know, one against five. And, and in order to beat us, you know, it's going to take a group effort. It's not going to just take one guy. And I think that's why it's so hard to beat us in the half court. <laughs> Any more questions for the SDSU student athletes here in the interview room? Anyone on Zoom who's with us? Okay, we will let these gentlemen go. Thank you. Appreciate your time today and good luck. Thank you. Good luck.
Okay, attention, uh, members of the media. We are about four minutes away from welcoming the Alabama student athletes to the dais in the interview room. We'll start with them at 110, and then Coach Oates will join us at 125. So just a couple minutes till the Crimson Tide arrives in the interview room. Thank you. Okay, as we wait for the uh, Crimson Tide to come to the dais, just a few quick reminders that you're probably so familiar with. 
Please make sure your phones and electronic devices are set to silent. Those of you who are joining us via Zoom, uh, if you have questions, please use the raise hand feature and we'll get to you as soon as possible. And here in the interview room, just a reminder that we have microphones around, raise your hand. Uh, we will get one to you. Let us know who you are, where you're from, the uh, outlet you represent, and then ask your question to a particular student athlete. That helps with the transcription services, uh, which will be done by ASAP Sports, and they'll have that out shortly after the press conferences. Okay, as the uh, Alabama student athletes get settled here, we're gonna open with questions to begin here from the interview room. So if you do have a question, raise your hand and we will have someone get a microphone to you. We can start here on the right side, middle. Uh, Mike Rodak with AL.com. For Javon, you'd mentioned on Twitter today about the, the balls um, potentially being overinflated in, in the tournament. Just what have you noticed from that and how has that affected you? Um. <laughs> Yeah, I just feel like sometimes, you know, the balls are just a little too bouncy. Um, I don't think it's affected me personally this this tournament, but, you know, it's been something that the guys talk about in the locker room. More questions? Right side, back row. For Brandon, uh, Ryan Hennessy, WBTM, NBC 13 in Birmingham. Just want to ask about the groin. How's it been and how helpful was the break from Birmingham? Um, it's been really good. Uh, I feel like me and Clark uh, spent a lot of time with it um, during the break. So I um, feel like I can just go out here and compete with my team at 100%. Any more questions from, OK, back left side, back row. Uh, Mark, Bryce Miller, San Diego Union Tribune. It seems like San Diego State's a interesting combination of physicality and size and really experienced guys. They don't play any interclassmen. Uh, how do you view them in terms of that type of matchup, you know, inside? Uh, you know, um, very uh, older team, you know, uh, but I feel like we uh, prepared with a great non-conference schedule and a great uh, conference schedule to, uh, to prepare for them. Next question on the uh, back row left side. Trey Wallace, outkick. Brandon, does, does San Diego State remind you of anybody in the SEC that you guys have played against this year? Um, maybe Texas A&M, maybe an Arkansas type of bunch. Who do they kind of look to you like? Um, I think uh, they're being viewed right now from us. It's just uh, a team that we have to go out and play um, really hard against. Uh, we know they're a veteran team, uh, so they're going to be physical. Uh, 
probably more experienced than us. Uh, but I know that they're going to come out and play hard. I feel like we just have to come out and um, give the most energy that we can uh, possibly bring. Right side, center aisle. Hey, Julian uh, with Fox 5 San Diego. I guess for the three of you, what have you seen on tape from San Diego State so far that's led to their success uh, to get to this point? Um, well, we started watching film over the break. Uh, we saw that they play uh, for a four and a five, a legit four and a five. Uh, I feel like, uh, well, we know that they're a veteran group, of course. I um, think we just have to come out and just compete. Oh, yeah, I agree with him. You know, a veteran group, you know, the defense, uh, they cause some teams problems, but I feel like we're prepared for them. Yeah, definitely their physicality stood out. <clears throat> um, you know, like these guys said, veteran group, you could tell that, you know, they've been playing college basketball for a while, and, um, you know, they look like a really good team on film. More questions here in the interview room. Far left side, <clears throat> second row. Danielle Lerner, Houston Chronicle. You guys have obviously ha experienced these last few weeks being the number one seed, but when you look at this regional, there are, I guess, more underdogs, quote unquote, than there are in other regions of this tournament. Have you found any useful tricks or, or tips to kind of keep yourselves um, as you've been dominating in your first two games from getting complacent and, and kind of just trying to handle that dichotomy? Um, I feel like uh, us as a group, we just um, take it slow. Um, we, don't, we don't overlook any team. Um, we know this team is here for a reason. They beat um, highly, highly um, talented teams. Uh, so we just have to come out here and just um, play our game, really, and just not let them uh, speed us up or play at their tempo. And another thing is we, uh, we take it one possession at a time. That was Brandon and Mark. Thank you. Question now right side, back row. Brandon, coming from Birmingham the first two rounds, what's the message to the fans? Not too bad of a trip up 65. What, what, what do you want to see in the crowd tomorrow? Um, well, uh, we know um, as a team they they came out and showed up for in Birmingham and Nashville. Um, um, so we just hope to see them here in Louisville um, tomorrow um, and just root us on. And we are always going to play for them and feed off their energy. Okay, left side center aisle. Tim Sullivan, Leo Weekly. Um, we saw photographs of uh, Coach Saban at your practice yesterday. Wonder what his message was and. Has he uh, cleared up the, the question about wrong place, wrong time? Um, it was a, a great experience in practice uh, for me, I can say, because, you know, I always grew up being an Alabama football fan, so Coach, Coach Saban has always been um, a great role, a role model for me. So um, it was just great just seeing him um, arm, arm length uh, away from me. Okay, next question, right side in the middle. Oh, okay. Well, let's go to front row here on the left. Brent, you've had a few games, the Houston game uh, last week against Corpus Christi. I mean, a lot of players have games where they aren't all the way there, uh, aren't as con Is there any common thread to your tough games that you've identified at this point that you have to solve each night? Um, well, like, I mean, just knowing I have guys behind me to back me up when I'm not on, um, each night, it's kind of, it's kind of a great thing to have. Um, I think the the leaders next to me here on, on this podium today is uh, they kind of challenged me to be the guy who I am today, uh, on and off the court. Um, so it's just not about scoring the basketball. I think it's uh, the little things like playing defense, uh, getting every rebound, taking charges, uh, just really doing the dirty things on the court to get wins. Okay, let's go to the front row on the right here, and then we'll take a Zoom question. Gary Graves, Associated Press. Um, I guess with, with Saban at practice yesterday, uh, kind of brings attention to the fact that you all have brought a lot of attention to the basketball program from what is considered a football school. How have you all kind of uh, embraced the, you know, kind of getting that kind of profile these last two or three years? And you, where, where do you feel like it, it, it kind of establishes the school? 
I feel like it kind of uh, motivates us guys. Um, I feel like um, we have a, a, a winning school. It's just not about the football team um, at Alabama. I feel like it's Alabama basketball, Alabama football, Alabama track. Um, all the organizations there, it's just, I feel like it's just a winning program. Okay, next question is going to be from uh, our Zoom attendance. Chris, you have a question? Hi, I'm Chris Hudgeson over at KEIT in Jonesboro, Arkansas, for all three of you guys. Wanted to ask you about Brian Hodgson being hired up here as the new Arkansas State head coach. You know, what has he meant to you guys in terms of a coach and recruiter and everything, and especially as a person? I'm, I'm so happy for Coach. Um, that's who recruited me when I decided to transfer from Villanova. I'm super happy for him. Um, he's since he's, he's gotten to Alabama, he's brought great players in. Obviously, you know we've been winning a lot more, and um, you know I just couldn't be more happy for him. Thanks, Javon. Let's bring questions back into the interview room here, right side. Let's start here on the end, and then we'll go a few seats over. Isaac Bourne from Mid Major Madness. Kind of talking back about this uh, San Diego State team, you guys play a majority of your game or play a lot of your game on the perimeter, really good at three-point shooting, and San Diego State has one of the top three-point defenses in the nation. So how are you going to adjust this game to kind of you know, go against one of these better defenses? Um, I feel like you know, we played a, a bunch of teams this year who's tried to run us off the three-point line, and you know, we've adjusted, and we've made um, – We've gotten to the basket if they try to run us off the line. You know, we just we get a we, we get a feel for how they're guarding us, and and we try and you know find that adjustment. And you know, it's, this won't be the first team who who's uh, you know not trying to let us shoot threes. So I think we're we're pretty prepared for whatever you know they they throw at us. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Javon. Right side. Uh, Mark Ziegler, San Diego Union Tribune. I know you guys can't talk about the incident. Hopefully, Brandon and, and Mark can both answer this, the specifics of the incident. But I'm, I'm curious, there's a lot of external distractions around your team. How have you been able to deal with it and not have that sort of morph into the, the basketball court? How have you been able to block that out? Well, I feel like we just lean on each other. Yeah, uh, to go with what he said, we just lean on one another. Any more questions here in the interview room? Okay. We will let the Alabama student athletes go. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank All right, Coach Oates is on his way up now. 
So you get settled in. Just a reminder, raise your hand for uh, a microphone, and we'll get it to you as soon as we can. So you get settled. would ask uh, if he doesn't mind to open with an opening statement here. Coach, welcome to Louisville in the Sweet 16. It's great to be here in Louisville. We, uh, a, we were in the Sweet 16 two years ago. It's a lot different situation this year with having the arenas full. Completely different team. You know, Quinterly's the only uh, scholarship player that was on both teams. He's obviously playing great for us now. He played great for us then. But come back with two separate teams, uh, you know, all the teams in the Sweet 16 are, are pretty good. San Diego State's really good. You know, we've got two teams with us and them that are both top five in the country in defensive efficiency. They're, they're a great defensive team. They've got a lot of players on the offensive side that can create shots. We're, we're going to have to be great defensively. You know, there's similarities in that. There's obviously style of play uh, differences. They play a lot slower. We try to get it up and down. You know, so it's going to be who can make it more their tempo. But I think we've been able to show that we win games in the half court too. You know, when you've got a good defense, I think you're in most games. So. Uh, we're going to have to be great defensively. We're going to have to rebound the ball well. And, you know, we're still going to try to play fast, but we're not, you know, if you watch us play, we don't force the tempo on our defensive end. You know, we're not gambling, pressing, trying to get the tempo. We're playing pretty solid on the defensive end. So, you know, we'll push on offense, try to score early. If, uh, you know, if they're getting back and not letting us score early, we, we've won plenty of games in the half court too. So we're, we're confident we can win either way, but we're going to have to be tough. They're an older group. We're younger. Uh, we don't have near the experience they have, which, you know, with most groups, I think that worry you. I think this group's shown how much maturity we have. And the fact that we're young doesn't mean that we're immature. It just means guys haven't played as many games and they're a little bit younger. I told our guys this morning, the NBA drafts, a lot of young players, and they start them early in their career, and they're pretty good. Like, I think you guys have been mature in this lack of experience that people are talking about. I, I'm not worried about it because you guys have shown how mature and prepared you can get. The age doesn't necessarily matter. It's more what your mindset is, how focused you are, how mature you are when you walk in. So we're looking forward to playing a great game. We're happy to be here. It's a great time for Alabama basketball. Thank you, Coach. Let's open it up. Start here on the right side. We'll go one and two. Ryan Hennessy, MEC 13 in Birmingham. Coach, this location, the reason why you guys are here, the fans is a big reason. Quick trip. What's the message to the fans that can make a long weekend out of this? They've been great for us the entire NCAA tournament. We'd love it for them to uh, come support us just like they did in Birmingham. Yeah, when you get the number one overall seed, you get to choose your first two locations. So we chose the two closest places, obviously Birmingham and now here. So, you know, it's uh, it's not, not too long of a drive and we need their support. They've been great for us all year. We, we love to hear them. We, we loved having them in Birmingham. We loved them having them in Nashville for the SEC tournament. So just a little further, you can stop through Nashville on your way up here to Louisville. Dane O'Neill with The Athletic. Neat, John Calipari used to like to say, I'm not going to let anybody steal my joy. And with everything that's been going on around your program, have you guys, have you, and maybe even more importantly, your players been able to enjoy this? Yeah, we're having a blast. Uh, it's, we're winning games. We know who we are. We've got a great group of guys that lean on each other, that have come close. We've never lost sight of the fact that we have a heartbreaking situation surrounding the program. Like that's the fact that we have such a good group of guys enables them to keep that as they should be a serious matter. And it has been, but you know, you, you play basketball from the time you were young to get to these moments and we're going to enjoy these moments that they've earned the right to enjoy the moment they're in. And, I think our guys are having a lot of fun. And you know what? I uh, I delete all social media apps off my phone before the season. I encourage our guys to spend more time watching film and everything. We just, we're going to control the stuff we can control. And we, our guys have done a great job being cognizant and aware of the entire situation we have going on, the big picture stuff. But they've done a great job of being where their feet are at and focusing on 
the details at hand. When we're in a video session, that's where our minds are at. When we're in practice, that's where our minds are at. We're focused on practice. When we come into the games and the ball goes up, our entire focus is on what we need to do to, to win that basketball game. So I think that's enabled us to enjoy the moment as we're in the moments too. Okay, a bunch of questions on this right side. We'll start in the front, then middle, then back. Nate, the, the three-point shooting numbers across the tournament are pretty low. The, the ball, the actual ball itself keeps coming up. I think one of your guys said that you know, guys in the locker room are talking about it. Other sites, guys have talked about it. Is this a, an actual thing? Uh, should there be a uniform ball across college basketball? You know, have a new ball for the postseason seems kind of odd. Yeah, we, we kind of had the discussions of staff. So we, I, I'm big on the players being as comfortable as they can be the environment we try to shoot in the arena we're in every you know if we get into a place we shoot the night before you know Charlie Henry was in the NBA was on our staff talked you know he's just like oh, I have no idea how college doesn't have a uniform ball like <laughs> you couldn't imagine you're in the NBA everybody plays with the same ball every night so here we've got you know we've got all the different balls we could possibly play with through the year our Garrett our equipment manager has you know enough of them that the Days leading into that particular game, we play with that ball. You know, Nike School, Wilson, whatever. It go down the line. I, I do think it'd be a lot better if the NCAA mandated a particular ball. I'm sure there's money aspects involved with all that. I, look, I don't see. I don't play anymore. I used to play. I still shoot occasionally when we're in there with the guys. I've felt the ball. You can pump up any ball to be too hard. I, it'd be great if the referees actually made sure it was within the guidelines of how hard it's supposed to be pumped up. Because obviously if you pump it up to where it's a rock, you're not going to shoot as well. It's going to come off the rim every time it hits us. But I don't see that there's an issue with the ball. I think defenses get better. As you know, you look at the teams that are still winning, most of them have pretty good defenses. When the defenses get better, shooting percentages go down. Let's you know, I'm sure the NCAA is on top of making sure the balls are all going to be correctly inflated and all that here for these Sweet 16 rounds. But we, we got we got to do a great job of getting our shooters open shots. And I'm not going to be too worried about the ball. I'm going to be more worried about the stuff I can control. We preach it to our players all the time. I have zero control over the ball. I don't think there's an issue with it. Let's make sure we get our really good shooters as many good looks as we can and get the percentages up to where we need them to be. Staying on the right side, third row. Hey there, Coach. Um, obviously, Coach Saban stopped by practice yesterday, but a day before that, he had some pretty pointed words about a player that had gotten into trouble on his own squad. And, you know, that man is intentional just with some of his word choice. I'm curious if you took that to be a criticism of how the basketball team has handled the tragic situation um, this winter. Uh, yeah, so he and I talked that night, and I didn't take it that way at all. Got a ton of respect for Coach. You know, I said my opening press conference when I got hired at Alabama that he may be the best coach for team sports and modern sports history. I mean, I when I was a high school coach back in Romulus, I had a whole section of Saban quotes in our practice plan. I still have it. I uh, I probably use them a little less now that we're here, and they get they get plenty of Saban quotes just in the regular media. But I, I've got a ton of respect for him. He's been tremendously supportive of our program since he's got here. I mean, he says it all the time. He wants the entire athletic department to do well. He's been at multiple games this year. He came yesterday to speak to the team, and, you know, he was good. Players loved it. I'm, uh, he and I got a great relationship, and I'm really thankful for the support that he's given us and continues to give us with the basketball program at Alabama. Okay, we have two more questions here in the back row on the right, and then we'll go to the left side. Billy Witz with the New York Times. Nate, the Alabama, I'm sure like a lot of schools, they bring in speakers um, either externally or internally to you know, address things like how to, how to treat women, NIL opportunities, even media training. And I'm just wondering, even though like guns are legal in Alabama, I understand, but they're not, not allowed to be on campus, are, there, are athletes at all counseled or addressed on issues dealing with guns yeah we've and we've had like you said we bring in speakers of all different types throughout the year you know we've had that's been addressed they 
certainly, and we've got an unbelievable administration with us, and they take the opportunities when it's appropriate to reemphasize things that have been previously talked about and need to be emphasized, and that's been done. And I think our administration and our coaching staff's done a great job using the resources we have at Alabama to help to really help these young men grow into better adults and better citizens moving forward. What was the message before? I'm sorry if this is warm. What was the message then? I guess at some point earlier this season, before the shooting, about about guns and whether you know just. I mean, we we emphasize you have to follow university policy. There's a there's a university policy, and as a student athlete, you should be well above reproach on all university policies regarding any of that type of stuff. Okay. Next question here on the right. Nate Kelly, Tuscaloosa News. Uh, Nate, San Diego State's three-point defense is, I think, number four in the country. What stands out about that group and what they do against uh, around the perimeter? Yeah, so if you look at the way they guard, a lot of teams get their threes off, you know, running a ball screen or an action. you got to pull a third defender in. You get that guy's got to go from rotation to help. They switch a lot, one through five. You know, they, I think they switch all the time, one through four on ball screens. A lot of times they switch with the five. Sometimes they don't. You know, they definitely have it in their package. But when you switch, you don't have to pull a third defender and you guard the pick and roll with two. Now you may have to get some help on a post up or helping your big. But they do a great job. You know, a as a whole concept of how they guard defensively. You know, their coaching staff does a great job. But then their players individually. You know. We get a lot of threes. Our, our guys are able to beat players one on one. So obviously they switch. They've got their fo power forward or center on, you know, our point guard. And they can beat them, get in the lane. All of a sudden help comes. We spray the ball out. They do a great job not getting beat. So I mean, people can look at yeah, just get out, challenge. Well, it's more than that because if you don't help once you get beat, you're giving up a layup. I mean, you see some teams just refuse to help. They're scared of the way we shoot it, so they're not going to help, and we end up with. 40 at the rim attempts and shoot 80% of those. So you can't just choose to not help our sh off our shooters or you're going to give up layup after layup after layup unless you can sit down and guard the ball and not get beat. They have really good individual defenders that don't get beat. We're going to have to do a great job on our offensive end. I mean, we, now we've played some really good defenses in the SEC. I mean, you look at Tennessee's. I mean, if you look at the top five defenses, I think – we're one of them. And then after we play San Diego State, I think we'll have played three out of the four. So like we we played against great defenses. They didn't have fun. We lost at Tennessee. This is another one of them. We're going to have to be on point. They're tough. They're physical. They're big. They're strong. They move their feet. They take pride in it. You know, so we're going to have to do a good job and be sharp. And we can't turn the ball over. That's another issue. They, they will force turnovers with how physical they are, too. Got time for one more question, actually, and that's on the second row on the end, on the left. Danielle Lerner with the Houston Chronicle. I'm curious, with the David and Goliath narratives that tend to be really common throughout this tournament, how do you approach that as a one seed? Do you lean into it, or do you try to kind of flip it on your on its head a little bit, um, you know, to to motivate your guys and prevent from overlooking your opponents? Yeah, I think what makes the uh, NCAA tournament such a great event is what you're talking about. I mean, I go back to when I was a kid and you see these, you know, I'm thinking about Bryce Drew and hitting a shot at Valpo and just all those great upsets and shots. So, but it, you've also got great games between two great teams. I'm thinking about, you know, Bobby Hurley's Duke team where Christian Leitner hit the shot against Kentucky. I mean, that's, that, that's one of my best memories of watching two really good teams play. So, you don't just have to have the upsets to make for great TV and for the fans. You can have really good teams going at it, which is what I think we've got here. We we never lie to our team and try to tell them this. You know, like we don't try to – we tell them the truth. So we tell them, you know, when we're focused and concentrating on what we're supposed to be focused on, we should be the best team in the country. Now, we need to play like it, and we've had – enough games this year where we haven't done that. So we're not trying to flip it and tell them anything different. They know we're the number one overall seed. They know what we're capable of when we bring it. 
And we, but we need to bring it. They also know we're capable of losing at Oklahoma by a large margin. You know, we lost to Tennessee. We didn't guard very well against Gonzaga. Took a loss last regular season game of the year. We went to A&M. Weren't what we needed to be. Took a, like, we've taken enough losses against good teams and some that weren't as good to where they, they know what they have to do on any given night. So, no, we're not. I mean, the David Goliath thing, from here on out, I think we're going to be playing really good teams. It's going to be two great teams going at it, and it would be good for college basketball, and our guys just got to be ready to go. All right, we're out of time for this uh, segment. Coach, appreciate it, and good luck.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Coach Mitch Henderson is on his way to the interview room. He'll be here in a couple minutes. And just a reminder, and to those of you just joining us now, uh, when you set your phones and electronic devices to silent, if you don't mind, and when you have a question here in the interview room audience, please uh, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Then let us know who you are, where you're from, and uh, then ask your question to Coach. But he'll be here in a couple minutes. If you're joining us via Zoom and have a question, please use the raise hand uh, feature, and uh, we will get to you as we can. As Coach gets settled here, we're just going to ask uh, you to uh, open us up with an opening statement here. Welcome to Louisville in the Sweet 16. Uh, so this is uh, really such a pleasure to be here. We, um, I'm actually I'm from the Midwest. We, my family, when I was 12, we moved from Vincennes, Indiana to Lexington, Kentucky. Um, used to grow up going to Kentucky games, Louisville games. And um, so it's familiar for me, not for our guys, but... Um, I was so psyched to get a Louisville Slugger bat today with my name on it. <laughs> my wife's like, "What? Well, calm down, you know, but I, I love that stuff. Um, we've had just a really special month at Princeton. Um, Andre Polvolt, uh, excuse me, NFL. Sandre uh, Polvolt, national champion. Uh, we've had a national wrestling champion, and uh, our women's basketball team has been terrific. And um, our community are, is really tight-knit. There's 5,000, over 5,000 undergrads, but over a thousand student athletes. So that's a large percentage of a school that is heavily involved in athletics and everybody kind of rise, the rising tide lifts all boats. Everybody's really connected and it was fun walking around our campus the last three or four days, like just seeing the smiles on other student athletes, the reaction towards our players. Um, you know, there's stars galore at our university, <clears throat> economics professors, chemistry professors, and uh, fun to, Fun to see our guys be recognized as celebrities. Thank you. All right, open it up. It's, we're going to start here on the left side. We've got one in the front row, one in the second row. Actually, up front first, and then we'll go to the second, and then to the third row <laughs> on the left side. What's up, Jerry? Mitch, uh, Jerry Carino, Asbury Park Press. Mitch, over the last week or two as you made this run, what were some of the most poignant interactions you had with people and you know you had the governor in on Tuesday. Uh, anything that really jumped out at you as as a wow moment? Uh, visitors to practice and stuff, or just anything? Uh, yeah. 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 So we we FaceTime with Senator Brooker this morning from uh, from Washington D.C. He shared some really cool words with our guys. Um, I think the highlight was we, we as we left campus. Uh, about 1.30 yesterday, there were 1,000 people right, right outside of the Caldwell right there, right, right in front of Jadwin. And I, you know, just, just amazing. Uh, the school spirit and support, we really just kind of put it out there, hey, this is time we're leaving. I get, Jadwin's right next to uh, Frick Chemistry Lab, where I get my coffee every daily, and I see a organic chemistry professor there, and he's always like, hey, Mitch, you know. And I, as I was getting on the bus, he was like, come on! <laughs> so, I mean, for us, that it's cool to be, to feel connected to your school because that's what we're all about, is the interaction amongst the students and the professors. That's what Princeton is. It's an undergraduate special institution. So I'm CNN, Good Morning, and Good Morning America, and Jim Rome Show, and Dan Patrick, you know, we've had an amazing week, but that to me has been the most special thing is, is how um, our school and our university has felt. Stand on the left side here for a couple more in the pink shirt, second row. Joel Lorenzi, Omaha World Herald. Mitch, how many players have you maybe seen, like Ryan Kalkbrenner on, on both sides of the ball? And I guess how different or difficult is it to plug him in when game planning? I just missed the first part of your question. How many players have you seen that are quite like Ryan Kalkbrenner on, on both sides okay, of yeah. the ball? Um, I haven't seen anybody like him this season. Um, I think as we get further along in the tournament, th that'll be more and more true. Um, as the level of talent goes up, and um, he's a terrific player and influences the game in, in very unusual ways that are, are hard for us to prepare for, um, and them hard too. Um, and they're terrific, well, so well coached, and they have great continuity. Um, so I think that 
that highlights the talent of the team, and we know that there's this is a great challenge. We're gonna okay, uh, yeah, on the aisle here in the third row, and then just hand it to the guy next to you, and then go behind you, and then we'll come to the right side. <laughs> yeah, hi, Mitch. Uh, Rick Bozich here from WDRB in Louisville. Like you, though, I'm, I'm a native Hoosier. Um, what were your family's connections to Vincennes? And I also know you lived in Lexington. What are, were some of your fondest memories of, of being in Lexington? Yeah, my dad was an electrical contractor. Uh, I worked for Miller Construction Company in Vincennes. Um, that's why I learned how to play basketball. I went to Dan Sparks basketball camp right there at Vincennes Junior College. My favorite thing in the world was Vincennes Lincoln Alice's were state champs in 81 and 84. I followed those guys around. I would draw them pictures before and after games. I mean, um, <clears throat> we, we moved to Lexington because of work. My dad uh, got transferred to Davis H. Elliott right there in Lexington um, when I was 12. So, um, you know, I, it, when you, first time I had seen four lanes going in the same direction was on my visit to Princeton. <laughs> uh, I love growing up here, it's special. You know, in Vincennes, it's the last, at least, um, sort of the last um, East Coast time zone, but you get you got light until 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. It's just an incredible way to grow up. It's a small town that loves sports and all the neighbors, everybody in the neighborhood kind of watched your kids for you. So I was outside all the time playing basketball, wiffle ball, hide and go seek, ghosts in the graveyard, whatever. It's just an amazing way to grow up. I don't know if I forgot your question. I just got excited about talking about Midwest stuff. No, I can't talk about this stuff at home. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Courtney Whitty, oh man, Dean Dean, the free throw king. You remember uh, Dean Tolbert? Uh, so we would every year the tough game was going through Bossy uh, Evansville Wrights and at, at the incredible high school gym. I tell my staff all the time, you know, six, I, I, maybe I have this stat wrong, but 16 of the biggest 20 high school gyms in the country are in Indiana and Kentucky, and this is an incredible place to grow up. And if you like basketball, and uh, Louisville, Lexington. I was obsessed. And when I, we moved to Lexington, Patino had just arrived. And that was Richie Farmer, Darren Feldhaus, Sean Woods, um, Pelfrey, and Mashburn got there in 90. And, and uh, I was on my visit to Princeton when, when Leitner hit that shot in 92. Um, I hated Duke. <laughs> uh, no, no. I mean, I, I mean, the staff at the time, this was interesting. The staff at, at Kentucky at the time was Patino, Herb Sindek, Ralph Willard, and Tubby Smith. My junior high basketball team was me, Kevin Willard, and Gigi Smith, who were all Division I head coaches at Tate's Creek Junior High. How about that? Right over there, hey, Mitch, hey, Steve Politi from the Star Ledger back in Jersey. Hey, Steve. Hey, hey, this is a time of year when a lot of coaches use what happens in March as a springboard to another job. I'm curious if you, if you see yourself as, as the kind of guy who could just stay at Princeton for, if not his entire career, sort of the way Pete Carrill did for, for years and years and years. Um, I mean, I, I, this, is a, this is a wonderful place to be head coach. I pinch myself every day with the opportunity to be representing Princeton. And I always felt like the luckiest guy in the world that got admitted. And you know, you're, you're, you're the beneficiary of so many things at a place like Princeton. And, when, and um, you'll see tomorrow our fan base is just unbelievable. And, we were in Sacramento for first round games, second round games, and Coach Carrill, after he left Princeton, was in SAC. Jeff Petrie, who was a great player at Princeton, and UCLA was there, and that's the, the team that we beat in 96. And, yeah, but Coach's influence on the game and it has resonated for us, and it, you know, it, we have brand, uh, brand recognition in terms of basketball because of Coach. Um, but you know, it's, uh, this is a special place to be associated with, and, I'm really, we, we are just so thrilled to be here. Back row on the left, and then we're going to go for some on the right. Yeah. I met uh, Pat Forty from Sports Illustrated. Hey, Doug Crook as well, I think, Vincennes Lincoln. Doug back Crook, then. I'm sorry, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah. Doug Crook. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> anyway, uh, my question for you, look, you guys went through a season without playing basketball. Yeah. How did you keep the core of your team together through that? that was, you know, we got to August of 2021. 2020, excuse me, and sort of became clear that we probably weren't going to play. And so the first part of that was, you know, uh, the student, my guys had to decide whether or not to stay in school because you, you had to drop out. We don't get, we don't have graduate school eligibility in the Ivy League. And everybody stayed in school, including the current seniors. And Matalako Mush, who's an incoming freshman, 
Uh, I remember talking, to, I was at the Jersey Shore and I was talking to his family on FaceTime and like, should we come to school? And I, you know, they decided to come and I didn't see him until February. We, we resumed school, remote schooling until the February. So the Zoom meetings for a basketball team is just what you think it is. It's, it's terrible. Uh, we, I mean, we'd have lunch Zoom, we would have lunch on Zoom, you know, break it up into small groups. We tried everything we could, but this is what I would say. I think we're here because of it. Um, you grow up, I think every COVID's affected everybody in its own way, but you know, you, for student athletes, you, you're, there's a maturity that developed. Um, maybe like, um, you got, we lost some fear of failure, perhaps, of what might happen. I mean, you got a season taken away at a young age. And so then last year, we won the league and didn't make, win the Ivy League tournament. That was another big factor for us, and, uh, motivational for us going into this season. But um, it, I, I don't think I'll know or will know until years from now how much I think I'll, we'll point to COVID and say that's, that's what this run was about. Okay, we're going to go on the right side here uh, in the third row. We've got two questions. Hey, Coach. Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you mentioned a couple weeks ago, I think after the first round, that your seniors, which is a lot of your team, have no extensions on their theses. Uh, I'm curious how that's going. Is it crunch time? Are they done? Or? Yeah, I, think, I think we got some extensions. Sweet 16. Here we go. You I know? don't know. I thought that wasn't <laughs> P Princeton policy. Hey, well, um, you know, the, the schools work with us very closely on, on thesis, but, uh, you know, I think that um, that's a big part of your, um, your path at Princeton is the, the thesis, your senior year. And you should ask the guys. They're, they're doing some really cool things, what they're writing about. Um, but I think, you know, we have a, an economics professor with us here, Tosans and Ryan are econ uh, majors. So we're, we're in good hands with, uh, with the thesis. How you doing, Coach? Mitch Brown, Fox Lexington. Uh, you, you talk about your time in Lexington and, and the brief stint you had, but the guys you played around, just how did those years kind of cultivate your love for basketball and kind of kind of bring this uh, this coaching aspect around for you? Yeah, I, I was, um, you know, <clears throat> both Vincennes and Lexington are really great high school basketball areas. Um, I went to Rick Pitino's basketball camp uh, and when I was a freshman and sophomore and he would play one-on-one -on -one with all the campers and talk so much trash. And if you, if you beat him, he was really good. He was probably in his late 30s at the time. He had to score three points, and all you had to do was stop him and score once. And then you got a shirt that says, I beat Rick Pitino in one-on-one. -on -one. And, I, and I got one of those shirts. Um, I tell you, and we played Iona this year, and I, I started to tell him, you know, and, and he was like, okay, good luck. And he you know. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this guy, you know, but, um, you know, it's, um, for, for me to, to end up be here, um, I'm really fortunate when my parents, you know, entrusted me, uh, entrusted the coaches at Princeton to, to say, hey, take care of our son. And um, it was like, again, I felt like the luckiest person come, you know, not, not knowing anything about Princeton. A question here in the third row on the left side and then up front. Hey, Mitch. Uh, Brooks Holden. Um, I'm from here in the Courier Journal in Louisville. Um, you mentioned you're a big fan of baseball, and you got to tour the Slugger Museum. Did you have anything that you saw that stood out to you that was your favorite thing? Um, you know, I'm outside of the bat with your name on it. Um, I mean, this, this, like everything is really cool. You know, um, but I, the, the seeing the, the joy in our guys' faces, and New York Post wrote a story, I think maybe or NewJersey.com, about Blake Peters being the most interesting man in the world. Um, you know, we love that. Um, I mean, I just think that you, when, again, like when families, what we do at Princeton is we cast a really wide net recruiting and we look for grades and character and really good players and parents entrust me to, to develop and give them a first class basketball experience and first class academic experience. And then you get to a place like this and you, um, you guys get to learn a little bit more about what their days look like. So that's fun. As, as fun as fun as this all is, it's um, it's just it's it's a life changing moment for our group. And you now, th three weeks ago, we were fighting for our life to make the Ivy League tournament. Um, so, uh, just just appreciating being present here is is really special. Okay, front row, left side, and then you probably have our last question here on the right. Mitch Mark Canizero from the New York Post. Um, 
Can you speak a little bit to the uniqueness of Tosan and, and what he brings to the table for you guys and the matchup against their big guy, Ryan, and, and how unique that is? And obviously he's, you know, is what he is. Yeah, Tosan is a very unique player. I call him a brilliant blinding light from heaven uh, for our program. He's like, um, I, I often will say to him, and we've, we've spent a lot of time together, like I need you to influence the game physically early, right away and he nods, and then he doesn't do it. And he, he absorbs the game. He's, a, he's like, um, it's like exquisite watching him play to me. He's like a nine or a 10 in soccer. Like um, he slows the game down for himself, which then speeds the game up for those around him. So Kalk Brennan is a very difficult kid in his own right, but Tosan's like Grant Hill. He like faces the rim, really good in space. Um, and we won't see a passer like him at Princeton for a really long time after this. He's, he's a really, I think, you know, modern day Princeton center, but facing point center, facing the basket. Uh, he's also a terrific student, humble, um, loves, he's at his best when his teammates are doing well, he's happiest, really special human being. Okay, last question here on the right. Isaac Bourne from Mid-Major Madness. So, Coach, can you speak to uh, what it's like being a mid-major team in this tournament and kind of representing the little guy when it comes to, you know, you being the, probably one of the smaller schools left in it? So at Princeton, um, I often hear from the guys that played in the 60s, 70s, uh, Chris Tomford, John Hummer, Ed Hummer, Jeff Petrie, Brian Taylor. These are first-round picks. Armand Hill, great players in the NBA. And so I hear from them a lot. And they come around a lot. So we might be considered nationally as a mid-major, but you know, our, our school thinks very highly of its basketball history. And we think that this team reflects that history very well. And I'd love, I'd put this team up against any of them. And so, I, you know, we, we followed St. Peter's run last year very closely. Just think that, you know, um, each team has like a special life to live in the tournament. And you're lucky and fortunate if you get a chance. I've seen it on the other side as a coach and watched teams forever, but um, this is, it, it, it's, it's amazing and um, hard to put into words what it, what it feels like on this end. But um, I'm glad if, if I, I don't think seeds matter as much as they used to. I think that there's a smaller world like Kalk Brennan and Jack Martini played together. Um, these guys know each other. You know, they, they, all the shoe circuit things, you know, everybody's more tightly knit and together. So there's less, um, not, there's no fear. Good deal. All right. Appreciate your Thank time. You. Good luck. I think your guys are waiting to get up here. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the Princeton uh, student athletes are on their way up to the dais in the interview room. Raise your hand for a question. We'll get a microphone to you. Tell us who you are, where you're from. And then when you direct a question uh, to the guys here, please uh, uh, direct it towards a specific Princeton Tiger. Hey, guys, how are y'all? Good, good. Welcome up, and we'll start with questions here on the left front row. Hey guys, Danielle Lerner with the Houston Chronicle here. I'd love to hear from each of you on this question. Um, how do you guys think about the labels of underdog and Cinderella? Do you like them? Do you dislike them? And do you feel like those accurately describe this team? Uh, personally, I love it. Um, I think it allows us to play with confidence, um, not only amongst ourselves, but amongst fans. and. Uh, allows us to get the crowd involved, which I think always helps with momentum. Basketball is a game of runs, so I think any support in that in those terms we can get, um, I think is great. Yeah, I think for me, uh, we know we know who we are and and uh, you know what what we bring to the table. So um, it's it's not it doesn't mean too much to me what what everyone else calls us. Uh, we I think we know 
we know who we are, like I said, so you guys can, can call us whatever you want. So I don't really, I don't really mind the label of Cinderella. Um, but personally, I think that if we just stick to our stuff, we could go out there, we could compete with anybody. Yeah, I mean, these guys said it all. Um, I think, you know, Borg said it best that at least the good thing that comes out of it is everyone in the arena supports you, you know, outside of the team you're playing against. So, um, you know, I don't think we pay attention a lot to the labels and all that because we know we belong here. So, um, yeah, I don't know, Cade. Yeah, not much left to say, but I, I think we, we definitely embrace it and uh, try to use that to get the fans on our side when we can. Okay, we're going to stay in the front row here, then go to the back on the left, and then we're coming over to the right. Jerry Carino from the Asbury Park Press, guys, like a Jersey re reunion here. Uh, question I asked Ryan in the locker room, but for you guys, the rest of you guys, any and all, uh, tell me about a poignant interaction you've had over the last week or two during this run, whether it was the governor or somebody random reaching out or somebody from your past that sort of symbolized the excitement you guys have generated. Uh, I had a nice standing ovation uh, at a restaurant back at Princeton. Um, so that was a cool moment. That was really special and uh, got to interact with fans a little bit there. It was cool. Um, one of my old professors from last year who I haven't talked to emailed me and we just had a nice interaction there. I'm sorry? Uh, sociology. Yeah, a lot of the same stuff. Um, just students, uh, professors around campus, just kind of, you know, give us a shout, hey, congratulations, that type of stuff. So uh, we appreciate all the love. It's, it's great to have that support. Yeah, definitely. Like, like all these guys have said, we've, we've definitely felt and seen the love around campus. And even this morning, we were on a FaceTime with, we were lucky enough to be on a FaceTime with Senator Booker um, from New Jersey. So that was super cool. He was able to kind of give us a few words and, and um, inspire us to go, to go forward. Thanks, guys. Stay on the left side and the back. Uh, yeah, Pat Forty from Sports Illustrated. Your coach just said there's a lot of cool senior theses going on. So for any of you all who are involved in that right now, what are, you, what are your theses and, and how's it been trying to do that and have an NCAA tournament? Um, so I'm writing a thesis. I'm an economics major, so I'm writing a thesis about um, the effect of traveling over multiple time zones on NBA winning percentage and um, how Vegas uh, money lines kind of assess that effect on the athletes. So it's been pretty fun. Also an econ major, um, so I'm looking at how diversity amongst uh, executive management and NBA teams affects the team performance. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, Taking a bit of a hold, obviously, uh, since the tournament's been going on, but it's, it's going pretty well. Uh, so I'm a sociology major, and my thesis is on how professional sports performance in a season can affect social behaviors in a community. It's like crime rates, voter turnout, um, things like that. And it's been a lot trying to balance this along with the tournament, but we're going to get it done. All right, left, right side here, front row. Uh, Joe Nugent, NBC Omaha, question for Tosan. Curious what you think about this Creighton basketball team. What kind of challenges you think you will see tomorrow night? Yeah, it will be a big challenge. Um, you know, everyone's, everyone's good. We're in the Sweet 16, um, obviously. But, you know, they're, they're a well-coached team. They're really balanced. Um, they have a lot of nice players. Um, you know, they have, they have a, a big who, who's um, a great rim protector and, and uh, an offensive force as well. And, you know, they've got, like I said, the well-balanced team. They've got a lot of pieces. Um, but, you know, so do we, and, and uh, we're looking forward to that matchup. It's, it's going to be a battle, I think. And, um, you know, we, uh, we're excited about, you know, our style of play and, and how we play and, and you're being able to showcase that um, again and, and hopefully more, you know, after this game. But it's a, it's a matchup we're looking forward to, definitely. Okay, two questions here on the right side, then we'll go to a Zoom caller. Hey there, Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal, kind of circling back to the theses for uh, those of you that are writing them. I imagine that, you know, after the first round of the NCAA tournament, you're maybe thinking, oh, okay, I've got some time in March to work on this. Like, what were your initial plans for, you know, crunch time of this, of getting it done, and how spectacularly did those get blown up? Well, uh, the original deadline for, for me and Tosan, at least, was April 13th, so coming up here pretty quickly. Um, fortunately, we got an extension, and we have a little more wiggle room. But yeah, it was going to be a lot of grinding on and writing papers, which is not always the most fun, but it's a lot better playing basketball, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, 
And go ahead. Uh, I I usually like plan ahead a little bit better than Ryan, so <laughs> I um I, I I managed to get some away, get some done earlier in the year. Um, you know, knowing that the end of the season can be a little bit hectic. Um, so yeah. Just a small follow-up, Ryan. I know your thesis is about time zones, and given that you guys flew all the way from Jersey to Sacramento, did you, you know, tell Coach anything of what you should maybe do to prepare? Um, I don't think I did, but uh, we we actually left on like Monday for uh, I think it was a Thursday game, so it gave us a few days to adjust. And I'm a California guy, so I like being out there anyway. All right. Next call, next question is here on the right side, second row. For Ryan, Matt, and Caden, this is a pretty stout Creighton backcourt defensively. What's the key to finding success on offense against them? I think uh, just finding a half step, making sure that we're helping each other out. Um, it's a team game, so we don't have to guard them individually. Um, just being solid, being tough. I think that's, that'll get it done. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And then um, on the other end, um, offensively, just, you know, taking care of the ball as always um, and, you know, not missing an opportunity to, to get a great shot. Yeah, I think, I think on the offensive end, it's just about doing what we do best, um, being hard to guard, moving fast, setting screens, and then working the shot clock a little bit and getting open shots. Okay, thanks, guys. We're going to go to one of our Zoom participants now. Jeff, you have a question. Hi, I beg your pardon. A couple of questions for Tosan, if I may, from uh, Newcastle, England, his hometown. Uh, Tosan, hi, Jerry Jackson here. I've just been to the academy, talked to people there, everybody rooting for you. You've got audiences, of course, both sides of the Atlantic. How are you feeling about it right now? Yeah, it's very special. Um, very thankful and fortunate to have, uh, you know, audiences from both sides. And I've definitely felt the love, um, you know, since, since the tournament started and, and before that as well, obviously. But, you know, it's been great, um, you know, hopefully being able to, to have, a, have an impact on the younger generation, um, you know, back home with British basketball and then obviously in the, you know, Princeton community as well. So um, I appreciate your guys' support. It's, it's meant a lot. And how much could you say at a time like this about your early success is down to the encouragement, the coaching, the general support you got from the academy in your early days? What, from the age of 14, I think? Yeah, those, those guys were always great to me and, and gave me an opportunity, um, you know, with me just starting out. Um, a really good opportunity to play for them, and, and um, you know, even more recently during the, the COVID year, uh, had the had the opportunity to to play and, and practice with the uh, the, the Eagles, <clears throat> excuse me, the Eagles team. Um, so you know, everyone's always been been really supportive from back home, and um, you know, nothing's changed since I've come over. I hear from you know a lot of coaches and, and former teammates a lot, so it's been really nice. Next question here on the aisle on the left side. For anybody that wants to answer, what was the year without basketball and the year on Zoom like from your perspective? Uh, I think in the long run, it, it ended up helping us out. Um, unfortunately, you know, Cade was too young. He wasn't there at the time. But um, yeah, it, it, was, it was unfortunate we couldn't play. That was obviously the biggest thing that we missed. But um, I think we, we were able to connect a lot just because it was all about ball. You know, we were, we were online for, you know, school a couple hours a day, and then we get together and practice. So um, at the time, you know, you're thinking this, this, you know, isn't the best situation, but I think in the long run it helped us out just building that chemistry and, and competitive spirit together. Thanks, Matt. Anybody else? All right. More questions here from the interview room. Front row, right, left side. Tosan, just to build on the question about uh, England, was March Madness on the radar over there? Uh, you know, within the basketball community, I, yeah, I, I'd say it is. But for me, growing up, definitely wasn't. Um, you know, majority of my life, and you know, being in it now and being over here, it's definitely, I missed out on a, on a lot. I think as a kid, and you know, the culture is unbelievable um, here, and you know, you hear about kids missing school to watch games, and and. Uh, you know all the brackets, and I've never filled out a bracket even even till till this day. So, I definitely missed out on, on a lot as a kid. I think. Just as 
a follow-up. Uh, your, your father was here for the Ivy League title and then for last weekend. What was that like to have him in from England for that? Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Um, you know, he's my biggest fan, um, biggest supporter. He's very vocal on, on Twitter, um, on social media. So, you know, he's super supportive of, of the guys, and uh, it, was, it was great to, to have him there, and I'm sure the guys felt the same way. Any more questions from here in the room? On the aisle in the uh, right side. This is just a, a fun question for all you guys, and you have to be honest. Did you guys know what state and what city Creighton was in? Ryan? Uh, <laughs> So uh, it's, I think it's in Nebraska, right? Am I, okay, yeah. Is it Omaha? I'm, I'm not. I'm not familiar with all the the cities in Nebraska, to be completely honest with you. So maybe Omaha, but okay, I'll go with that. I have no idea. Um, I <laughs> I, uh, I think I, I usually ask Zach Martini or Jacob or kind of those type of questions with, in terms of uh, U.S. geography. So uh, yeah. yeah. Honestly, I didn't really know until we found out we're playing Creighton. I did know. I just want that on the record. I knew where it was. I, I also knew. You know, I think Mush and I are both Midwesterners, so we kind of we kind of know our, our way around the area. That's true. All right. Anything else for the Tigers? Good deal. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Good luck, guys.
One, two, one, two. Test, one, two, one. Test one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, microphone test, one, two, three. Hello, hello. Um, super excited to be here today. Just numbers, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. Test one, two, three, one, two, one, one, two, one, two, three. 
Test one, two, three. One, two, one, two. Check one, two, three. Check one, two, three. Test one, two, three. One, two, one, two. Check one, two, three. One, two, three.
Attention uh, media members, the Creighton Blue Jays student athletes are on their way to the dais in the interview room. Get started here in a couple minutes with the uh, student athletes and then Coach McDermott after that. They can come on up. We're just going to. Okay. Yep, gotcha. I think that's who's up there. Oh, you're going to sing for everybody today? How are you guys? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, welcome uh, to our final press conference uh, session for the afternoon here, ahead of the Sweet 16 here in the South Region in Louisville. A uh, reminder that we have microphones. Raise your hand when you have a question. We'll get a microphone to you. And then please address your question toward a particular Creighton student athlete. If you are joining us via Zoom, uh, use the raise hand feature, and we will get to you as uh, soon as we possibly can. So we'll begin with questions from our in-house audience here in the interview room. Who wants to go first? Left side on the aisle here, guys. Uh, any of you guys can take this one. Um, a chance to make history this weekend, take the program to its first Elite Eight. What does that kind of mean to have that opportunity and with this group? Ryan, will you start here on the end, Ryan? In. <laughs> yeah. Um, man. Yeah. Uh, it would be great for us as a program. Obviously, like you said, it would be our first time getting to the Elite Eight. Um, huge for our program. Huge for our school. Just to just to build our brand. Um, and huge for us. Uh, we've been working for it all year. A lot of practices. A lot of ups and downs throughout the year. And um, yeah, it would just be a, a huge thing for our program. So we're looking forward to it. Okay. Next question here. Right side, second row. Joel Lorenzi, Omaha World Herald. For Ryan Kalkbrenner, I'm curious. I look back at the, the past two years, and obviously it's probably hard to uh, predict something like this happening so quick, but I, I look at how much you know R2, Trey, and, and Art mean to this team as, as sophomores, and I'm just curious, uh, where were you when, when you realized you know, the final guy of, of them had committed and um, you saw the whole ensemble, and maybe how did you feel about how it could change the trajectory of the program? Um, I don't remember like where I was when these guys committed. I just remember looking at that like whole class as a whole and being like, damn, we got a lot of really, really good freshmen coming in. And then when they got here for the summer and started to get to actually work out with them and all that, I could see like they're going to be really, really special. And they've been really, really special since they've gotten here. So it's just been a lot of fun having them on the team. And they're just super, super good players. Got one on the back left side, the corner standing up. Uh, for any of you guys, I'm, uh, this is Mike Merritt from Associated Press. What do you see in Princeton? What kinds of problems do they pose? Arthur, you want to get us started with that one? Yeah, uh, Princeton's a very solid team. I mean, you don't just beat Arizona. So we just got to take them seriously. and take what they bring at us. I mean, I feel like their biggest threat is their catch and shoot opportunities. If we could eliminate that, I feel like we should have a pretty solid chance. Back here along the aisle on the left. Uh, for Baylor, um, how much of a difference does it make having several days to prepare for a game this big as opposed to having less than 48 hours like you guys did against Baylor? 
Uh, yeah, you know, it makes a big difference. Obviously, you know, having a whole week to prepare for a team, you're able to um, catch up on their tendencies a lot quicker and, and get those dialed in. And then also just, you know, their 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 plays, their out-of-bounds plays, and just, you know, what they like to do as a whole, um, which makes a big difference coming into game time. Right side in the back. Adam Kruger, CBS Omaha. Trey, when when you look at this team of what you guys did well so last week, what you guys did well last weekend, what went so well against NC State and Baylor that you hope to replicate this weekend? Uh, I feel like it had a lot to do with our defense. I feel like we were locked in uh, on the defensive end, and we played the way that we we're supposed to, and being one of the best defensive teams in the country. And I feel like if we're able to sustain that throughout the whole tournament and, and against Princeton, then we'll be just fine. But I mean, it was mainly us just being locked in and playing together on the defensive end, you know, just knowing what each team's tendencies were and trying to take those away in both games. So. All right, anything else from uh, you guys here in the room? If not, we'll let these guys get out of here early. And we'll uh, wait for Coach McDermott here in a few minutes. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> Back out of here.
Coop. Cooper, watch out for that guy. Watch out for that guy. He didn't hear him. What? Tell him. Hey, Jonathan. Attention media members, uh, Coach McDermott is on his way to the interview room. Have him here in a couple minutes as we finish up our opening day press conference sessions. As Coach gets settled here, just a reminder, uh, if you're joining us here in the interview room, <coughs> to silence your uh, phones and electronic devices, raise your hand when you have a question, and we'll get uh, a microphone around to you. And we'd ask Coach uh, just to start us off with an opening statement about the uh, Sweet 16, and welcome to Louisville. It's good to be back. Uh, I was here in 2018 for the Kentucky Derby and uh, had a soggy but good day that day um, but thrilled for our team uh, to continue this journey uh, it's been a great ride with this group of uh, young guys uh, watching them kind of navigate uh, some adversity during portions of the season and continue to grow uh, closer together uh, continue to get better um, and as a result of that you know we're still alive and have a have an opportunity against a very good Princeton team on Friday Appreciate it. Going to start questions here in the uh, front row on the left. Kyle Franco with Kyle Franco with the Trentonian. Um, Greg, you've got a chance to see Princeton on film, and, and obviously they have a very unique player in, in Tosan Awoma. Um, just sort of what kind of challenges will that offense present for you? Well, it's not just their offense that presents challenges. Um, I think defensively, uh, I've been incredibly impressed. Uh, you know, I've watched a 
a lot of Ivy League basketball here the last three or four days, and, and I'll be watching more in the future because I've been really impressed um, with the execution. The coaching in that league is outstanding, um, and obviously for them to, to be co-champions in that conference, I think, speaks to how good they are. But, you know, defensively, they're, they're terrific. And then offensively, you know, Awoma is uh, – he can score and he can really pass. And if you allow him to do both, you're asking for trouble. So we, we have to figure out a way to slow that down. It's hard to do. And they, they space the floor with uh, a lot of really good shooters. And then when they miss, uh, you know, the first two games, 30 points, second, 30 second chance points for Princeton and, and uh, four combined for Arizona, Missouri. So I think that speaks to their Discipline defensively on the glass, blocking out, not giving you second opportunities, and then their second effort that they make to get to that offensive glass when they do miss a shot. So um, we have our hands full. This is a, a really, really good basketball team. It's not a fluke uh, that they're still playing. <clears throat> Over here on the right side, second row, Coach. Coach, you mentioned adversity. Do you, do you feel like it's been a streaky season? And if so, what would you attribute that streakiness and <clears throat> adversity to? I don't think it's necessarily been streaky. I guess if you if you look at it strictly on paper, it certainly looks streaky. We won six, we lost six, and at one point we won eight or nine in a row. Um, but part of that, especially in the conference portion of the season, was due to the strength of the Big East. And, and I think everybody now has found out how strong the Big East is. Uh, we have the best record uh, in the tournament percentage-wise at this point in the tournament. And I think there's a reason for that, that the league was really good. Uh, but there, there were some reasons that we struggled early. Uh, illness was certainly one of them and, and losing a key component. But we were also still growing at that time. Uh, we were starting three sophomores uh, that were 19 years old that had a ton of expectations plus placed on their shoulders and were dealing with that, all that the first time for the first time. And they navigated it extremely well. So uh, I'm really proud of them for that. Uh, but it's, it's all part of the journey. You, you end up at a an ending place at the end because of everything that transpired before that. And had that not happened, I'm not sure we'd be the team we are today. Front row here. <clears throat> uh, Joe Nugent, NBC Omaha. Mac, question about Jeremy Anderson. Was it a testament to his work last weekend when you guys were playing at altitude, you're trying to push tempo, and you didn't have oxygen on the benches uh, either? What I can say about Jeremy Anderson is, is if you go and look at how we played in the last four to six weeks of the season in every season prior to his arrival, and then you look at what we've done since he's been here, um, we've played our best basketball at the end of the season. And part of that is on him. Part of it, I deserve the credit because I listened to him. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, never have I, and, and this is certainly, uh, I really respect Jeremy's knowledge, and he doesn't recommend things without science to back it up. It's not just a gut feel. Uh, he, he has data, um, and, and I remember the first year having a conversation as he started to want me to sh shorten my practices as the season went on, and I said, why? And he said, well, if, if you, they're, they're not going to have a fresh body on game day unless they have a fresh mind. So my job is to make sure their body is ready, but I can't get their body ready if they're in a bad place because they think they've been overworked, they think they've done too much. So he and I have really forged a partnership. Uh, he knows I trust him 100%. I joke about it sometimes and try to get an extra five or six minutes out for a practice on occasion. Uh, but he is, uh, he's been a rock for me in terms of managing the season, uh, how much we can do when a guy comes back off an injury. He and Ben McNair work very closely together uh, to, to get that player back to full speed uh, at a, in a way that their body can help. So he, he's, he's been terrific. He's a, I've got a, you know, obviously my coaching staff's terrific, my support staff's terrific, but um, you know, Jeremy has changed the way I look at strength and conditioning. He's changed my approach to practice. And sometimes when somebody's been in it 30 years, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to take this old dog and get him to change and do some new tricks. And uh, Jeremy's done that. Left side in the back. Greg, uh, Mike Merritt from Associated Press. 
I'm curious how you, what you think you have to do to be able to slow down those second chance, the second chance points that you talked about. And also, how has your offense evolved over the years? Princeton does a great job of putting their body on you on the offensive glass. So we have to put our body on them first. It's that simple. Uh, if they get to us first and they create an angle, they create a seal, uh, you hope, then I have to hope that it bounces somewhere else or they're going to get it. Um, and, you know, offensively, we, we've just become, became better as the season's gone on. I think guys have gotten accustomed uh, to playing with, with each other. I think the bench has improved as the season's gone on. Francisco Farabello um, had a great game um, against uh, Baylor. Uh, Sharif M Mitchell's had his moments. Mason Miller's done some good things. Frederick King gives us a, gives Kalkbrenner a spell off the bench. So, you know, I think the first 10, 15, 16 games, and even more than that for us because of the losing Kalkbrenner for a while, uh, we were all trying to figure out what our role is. And I think those roles are very defined now, and I think guys are, are being champions in their roles. Uh, the guys that are playing a bunch of minutes are doing a good job off the floor with Jeremy and Ben uh, to manage their bodies so that they can handle that. Um, and to the point of the question earlier, we, you know, we, we didn't have oxygen on our bench in Denver like our opponents. And I think our guys kind of looked at that with a chuckle like, really? That, you know, they've got an oxygen mask down there? Like, we're, we're the ones playing fast here. So um, we're, we're in a good place. And uh, our guys are very confident in their teammates' ability to function on the offensive end. Stay on the left side there. Yep. Uh, Coach Mark Ziegler, San Diego Union Tribune. You had a very emotional, dramatic win against San Diego State last year in the tournament that was absolutely crushing for them. They were up nine with just over two minutes to go in regulation and lost. Um, it affected their season. I know you shared a, a charter with them to Maui this year. How much have you followed their season? And, <clears throat> and um, you know, do you have an appreciation for what they've been able to do in this tournament? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Steve Fisher's a great friend of mine, has been for a number of years. And, you know, I've known Dutch forever. Uh, and, you know, when we found out we were both in the Maui deal and we weren't going to have a full plane, uh, we, we worked together to share that charter. And Brian and I sat right, right across the uh, aisle from each other all the way to Hawaii and all the way back. And, you know, we're hopeful that we'd meet in the championship game. And one of us comes home 3-0 and and the other 2-1. and It didn't quite work out like that. But... Tremendous respect for their program, and you know we stole the game last year. We had really had no business winning. Uh, everything had to go right in the last three minutes for us, and it did. Um, and I'm not surprised that they've had the season they had. Uh, they've had. They're they're tremendous defensively. They're unselfish offensively. Uh, they played in a very good league, and they won a very good league. So um, you know it's it's good to see them here. I'm happy for Dutch, um, and you know I'm not surprised at the success that they've had. Anything else there, right side, third row? Adam Kruger, CBS Omaha. Coach, it seems like there's a lot more media attention on your guys' team this year with the camera crew following you around. If you compare this to your last Sweet 16 appearance, stress level-wise, do you feel the same, maybe more, <coughs> just because there's more media attention as far as getting game plans installed by game time? I mean, when you're in the bubble, I mean, you're – I was thinking about rearranging the furniture in my hotel room. That's what it got. That's what it came to uh, when you were in Indianapolis as long as we were. Um, it was just different, you know. You it was you and the team, and that's it. There was uh, there was no sharing the joy with anybody on the outside, uh, including their families, any fans. Um, but I think your I think your preparation. Uh, I mean, it, in some ways, it was almost hard to believe. You know, we were taking three buses to practice. Like, come on, really? Uh, you know, just so many things that <clears throat> that had to had to happen for that tournament to be pulled off. And the NCAA and Indianapolis did an incredible job of pulling it off and making it as enjoyable as possible. Um, but I think now, <clears throat> because you have the emotion and the celebration around it, you you have to bring the guys back down to earth on the practice floor to make sure they're ready. Uh, they, they had none of that the last time. And, you know, except for Sharif and Kalk, nobody else was there. So, it, you know, none of those guys experienced it. It's basically a brand new team in that regard. So um, I, think we've, I think we've managed it pretty well. I think the guys enjoyed their time back on campus and enjoyed time with their families after the game in Denver. Um, but once we hit the practice floor on Tuesday, they were ready to go back to work. 
Okay. Anything else? Follow up here. <clears throat> you guys had a great crowd showing in Denver, and, and earlier on Twitter this week, you, you made an appeal to Jay's fans to come down to Louisville. I mean, what kind of atmosphere are you expecting again from CU fans? Well, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys that likes an underdog and a Cinderella, too, so I have a feeling it's kind of going to be us in blue against the world uh, on Friday um, because of what Princeton has accomplished here in the first two games. Um, but I think we'll have a great showing. Uh, I was very impressed uh, with the amount of people that turned out uh, in, in Denver, especially coming off the Big East tournament when a lot of those same people were in New York. And um, I think we'll have a great crowd here. I think people understand that it's, it's hard to get to this level. Um, and, and really, in the modern era, this is the first time any of our fans have had an opportunity to come and um, enjoy a Sweet 16 because the numbers were so small in Indianapolis. So I think a lot of people will be here. I think it'll be a great environment and, and uh, obviously playing a really good team. All right. If that's it, we'll let Coach get out of Thank here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thanks. I appreciate it.